we talk about how non-Christians all live under the power of Satan. And even before we were saved, we live under the power of Satan. The point is, how are we you know, not following Satan at all? Do we let Satan affect us? Okay, Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. And you he made alive, God made you alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So while we were dead in sins, trespass means cross over a line, a line that we should not cross, doing something that we should not do. And, and sin, hamatia in Greek, it means fall short. That is like shooting uh, a target and you miss the point. That is sin. So trespass means doing something that we should not do. And sins means not being able to do the perfect thing. So while we were dead in sins, God made us alive. In which you once walked according to the course of this world. So at that time, we follow the way of the world. According to the prince of the power of the air. This is Satan. The prince of the power of the air. He is the prince. Uh, he has the power in the air. Now even though Satan is under God. But in this world now, he still has power. For those, he has power uh, for those who don't follow God, who don't obey God. When we obey God, we love God, then we can overcome Satan. But at that time, before we were Christians, we walked according to the way of the world, according to the, the, uh, of Satan, the way of Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. These sons of disobedience are the non-Christians. So the non-Christians have the evil spirit living in them, working in them. Now it doesn't mean they are, are filled with evil spirit. Now uh, they are affected by evil spirit. It's, there are difference. Okay. Um, affected by evil spirit means that they will be affected, influenced by the evil spirit to sin. Filled with the evil spirit means that that uh, you know we notice that people who are filled with evil spirit very often they are out of control. That evil spirit will control the body, and also when we pray in Jesus' name, they will be under. They will uh, cannot control the body. They cannot control their speech. They cannot praise God. So, not all non Christians are filled with evil spirit. Only those who are. You know, to who have much interaction with the evil spirit, that maybe they have they follow witchcraft or they have sinned seriously, and then they are affected. Uh, they are filled with the uh, evil spirit. So, in the past, we were living according to the way of the world and according to the evil spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, who now works in the non-Christians, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. So in the past, we also conduct ourselves in the lust of our flesh. We live following the, our sinful nature, the sinful desire. Lust means sinful desire, including sexual desires of our sinful nature. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh, the sinful nature, and of the mind, and were by nature's children of wrath, just as the others. So at that time, we were once, we once conducted ourselves in the in the lust of the sinful nature, and following the desires of the sinful nature and the mind, and then at that time we were by nature children of wrath. So this tells us that when Chris. When people don't live according to God, they are children of wrath. And even Christians who sin willfully and don't repent, they can be under the wrath of God. So we must understand this. That uh, in John 3.36, John 3.36, he believes the Son has eternal life and he who does not obey now, some translation put believe. Uh, actually, the word should be obey. That those who don't obey the Son will 
not have eternal life and the wrath of God will be upon them. So when, even when Christians who don't live in, uh, to obey God, they can be living under the wrath of God and then they can have all kinds of problems. So I hope that we all understand this. I hope that we all understand this. Don't think that when we sin, we can run away from God. No. God will see us all. God can see us all. God will see our sins. So there's no way to run away from Him. It's vain, you know, it's in vain to run away from God. Everything we do is in the sight of God. Even when we think about a sin already, God sees that. And if a person just lives in sin constantly, he lives under the wrath of God, the anger of God. But God who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loves us, even when we were dead in trespasses. So God, He is rich in mercy. He is full of mercy. Because of His great love with which He loves us, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. So when we were dead in sins, He made us alive when we heard the gospel. When the Holy Spirit moves in our heart to give us faith, then we were made alive. Suddenly, we see, wow, God is so wonderful. Suddenly, we say, I want to believe in Jesus. And suddenly, we say, I want to obey Him. We have the motivation to obey Him. So then He made us alive. Then the, per the person has a new life. When the person uh, truly believes in Jesus, trusts in Jesus as Savior, then they will have a new life. They were made alive by Jesus Christ. Uh, by grace you have been saved. We are saved by grace, not by our good works. So in these verses, it tells us that while we were sinners, God made us alive. And at that time, when we were not Christians, we were following the course, the way of the world, and following Satan, who is now working in the non-Christians. And we all also conduct ourselves following our flesh, our sinful nature, and fulfilling the desires of our sinful nature. And then at that time, we were children of wrath, just as the others. But God is rich in mercy. He's full of mercy because of His great love. He loved us even when we were dead in sins. He made us alive. He gave, gave us a new life. When we heard the gospel and, and the Holy Spirit moved us to respond to the gospel, and then instantly we were changed. Okay? Now... Interpretation of the Bible, I just actually already interpreted, but here I summarize a few points. When we were not saved yet, we were dead in sins and we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. So we were dead in sin and we live according to, the, uh, to the Satan. And this is the devil. He is now working in the sons of disobedience, that is in the non-Christians. When we were not saved, we were children of wrath. That is, we were under God's anger when we were not saved. Or when Christians, they continue to sin without repentance, they also live under God's anger. God is rich in mercy and He made us alive together with Christ when we were dead in sin. So He gave us a new life. Okay, uh, and then two, negative and positive examples of people. So non-Christians non all live according to the evil spirit. When a person is converted, does he turn away from all sins? So the condition of Christians. Now, supposedly, they have a new life. They were made alive. That all Christians should have, have the motivation to obey God and love God. But do all Christians do that? Many Christians, they think that they they gain something when they believe in Jesus and still live in the world. They think that they have both, both worlds. They have God's kingdom and the kingdom of this world. They think that I have salvation and then I also have the... Uh, uh, I can enjoy sin, I can enjoy things of the world. Now, then he's not turning away from his sins. Then what happened is, 
Satan has a grip on his life. He has given Satan a foothold and Satan will still kill and destroy his life. So does he, So when we were non-Christians, we were sons of wrath, sons of disobedience. We were living in sin following the sinful nature and following the ways of the world. So when we were converted, did we turn away from all our sins? Now, some Christians will say, well, it's hard to turn away from all sins, but at least we try, we repent and say, I hate sin. So when we bring someone to uh, Christianity, when we, con <coughs> when we convert someone, we want to tell them, God is good, God is holy, and God is love. And when you follow Him and love Him, He's very happy with you and he, he wants to bless your whole life. Your whole life will be blessed. But when we sin, then we have, we build up a distance bet between us and God. Then there will be a big gap. And God will be unhappy with that too. So we need to f repent of our sins when we sin. And we need to say, I'm sorry for my sins and hate sins and turn away from the sins. Not just to repent, but to hate the sins and turn away from sins. Now, if a Christian, you know, when we were not saved, we were following the move of the, whole, the evil spirit before we were saved. And then when a person is saved, does he follow the Holy Spirit totally? Many Christians don't. And then they still are greatly influenced by the evil spirit. There are some Christians we see that they always want to fight, they all, always want to argue, they tell lies, they, they uh, cheat, they do things that offend other people, they hurt other people, because they don't see that sins are destructive. They think that they can run away from God. Now, we need both the grace of God to understand God is full of grace. And at the same time, we need to understand the law that tells us that he who sows the flesh will from the flesh reap destruction. That he need to understand there is destruction. And he who does not bear fruit it will be cut off. So we need to understand this. But many Christians when they are converted, they are not, they don't turn away from all sins. And they, they still live in lust or unforgiveness or anger or depression. If a person doesn't con uh, turn away from all his sins, the devil will still influence him and steal from him. And quite a number of Christians follow Jesus and continue to sin at the same time and live in guilt. And then they always feel guilty. They don't have the free conscience. Then they will have many problems in their lives and they are not blessed by God. And that's why they have problems in a marriage. They have problems in a relationship. They have problem in a spiritual life. They don't have strength, and they have problem in uh, serving God. And even some pastors and leaders are tempted by lust, love of money, love of power, or to control people. So, pastors are not exempt from temptations. And some pastors, being uh, authoritarian, they want to control the church. They they don't want you know, they, they think they're perfect. They say they're perfect. And then they, uh, they just control the people. When, even when the people say, can we change this? Uh, this will be better for the church. They will not listen. They will be authoritarian. And they think that they are doing the right thing. Now, the Bible does tell Christians to obey the, the leaders. But it doesn't mean that the leaders will control the people. That actually... In a Peter's epistle, he clearly told us not to control the people, but to set a good example in front of them. And even some pastors. Now here, I have a picture of the news that pastor and wife steal millions from church. And some Christians and churches are demoralized. That means they lose the motivation. They lose... Uh, they are uh, disappointed when they see Christians and pastors steal money or have immoral, immorality. And other Christians follow the examples fall into sin. So some Christians see this and then they, they become 
you know, uh, disappointed and they lose faith in God. And then some Christians will follow example and say, well, other people can do that, I can do that too. Sometimes Christians say, well, even my pastor yelled at people, my pastor has a lot of negative emotions, so they will follow that. So as pastors, we want to be very careful with our life, that we want to, um, that we want to live out God's grace and love so that people can see Christ living in us. Now, if a person continues to live in sin, he can fall into temptation. He can, eventually, he can fall into hell. He can enter hell eventually. Now, more than one pastor has told me that there is a lot of lying, cheating, stealing of money in some churches of Africa. When I heard that, I feel very hurt. I feel very sad. And I hope that we all will say, Yes, Lord, please forgive me. Please help me see that following you is the best way. Following God is the best way. That we we don't want to uh, we want we don't want to live in sin because it's gonna bring destruction. We understand that this is destructive to our life. Uh, Satan will steal from our life and it doesn't mean we'll earn more. Some people think, okay, if I can get some money now, it will be beneficial. It's, it's not because God sees that. God sees our heart. God searches our heart. So I hope all pastors here will say, yes, Lord. We need to be extra careful whether we have any lust, any sinful desire, any uh, any lying, cheating, or mistreat of people, any stealing of money, misuse of the money, we want to repent and ask God to forgive us. Okay, so those are the, the negative examples. Now, and then positive examples, there are some Christians who are very faithful. They really change their life. They, their whole life is changed totally when they believe in Jesus. Okay, God's nature and grace. Ephesians 2, 4, but God who is rich in mercy. So God is rich in mercy. He has abundant mercy. His mercy is beyond our imagination. So God is full of mercy. He is full of grace. He, he loves us greatly. He is a God of love. And He's a holy God. So when we're dead in trespasses, when we have done nothing good yet, God chose to send Jesus to die for us. Then He sent the Holy Spirit to convert us and change us day to day, day by day. So He's rich in mercy and He changed us. So He, he saw that we live in sin. He understands that all Christians, all people are under power of Satan. We need Jesus. So He comes to help us. Okay, even when we sin, He does not give up on us. He continues to draw us to Him by His love. He continues to draw us. And He continues to change our life, to give us the motivation to obey Him, to live in holiness. And then the more we love and obey Him, the more He will pour His blessings upon us. So, now, um, when we talk about God's nature and grace, there are a few points that we can talk about that I hope you remember this. The first point is that we can talk about His nature. So here is His nature. He is a holy God. He's a God of love. And how He gives His grace to us. So He saves us. He gives us eternal life. And then He changed our life. He gave us a new life. He made us a life. And then thirdly, He passed that gift to us. He passed the gift to us that we can bring other people to live a holy life. He changed our life so that we can bless other people. And then four, when we obey Him, He'll bless us. So these are four points that we can think about. If you cannot think about how to talk about God's grace and law, uh, His nature and grace, then we want to first talk about His nature, how wonderful He is, uh, He's uh, rich in mercy, He is, He wants, he, he has compassion. And then, now it depends on the theme. Now here, because we talk about how we should turn away from Satan to live in according to God's way. So he is 
compassion, full of compassion, and he's, he's holy. And the next point is, he is, um, he give us grace, he give us forgiveness, and he give us a new life that wants to live holy in a holy way. And then he give us ability to help other people, ability to help other people. And four, he will reward us when we obey him. Okay, why many Christians continue to sin? Because we all have a sinful nature that causes us to think about sinning because we ha all have a sinful nature. Now, I have the sinful nature too, but I understand that the sinful nature is destructive. I understand that sin is destructive. So whenever I have any kind of sin, I hate it. I know that it's destructive. I know that Satan tried to destroy. So I don't give in to sin. I just... In the moment I notice there is any sinful thought, immediately I will ask God to forgive me and turn away from the sin. I want to have the full blessing of God. I want to be pleasing to God totally. So I want Him only because He can give me everything. Okay, so why many Christians can use sin? Because they, we have a sinful nature. Everyone has the sinful nature, even pastors. And then many Christians still retain the mentality when they were non-Christians and think that it's okay to lust, to tell lies, to steal, to take advantage of people. So many people still keep the mentality after they become a Christian. They still want to take advantage of people. They still want to kill, uh, steal from people. They want to get money whenever they can. They still want to tell lies. They still want to have lust. That they still live in a mentality of a non-Christian. And many Christians think that it's okay to sin and then to ask God to for, for forgiveness. They think it's okay, but it's not okay. And then there are temptations everywhere. So we can think about why many Christians continue to sin. And then remind and warning. So reminder, reminder and warning from God's law. Reminder and warning from God's law. Following the evil spirit will give the devil a foothold and the devil will come to steal, kill, and destroy. This is uh, John 10.10. 10. He will come to destroy, to steal, kill, and destroy. So the warning from, the, from God's law that we should understand that, um, that when we sin, there is serious consequences. God is not pleased with us and God will stop blessing us. So when Christians live in sin, they will, uh, God will stop blessing them. See, our ministry will be in vain because God will not be pleased with our ministry when we continue to sin. So when we continue to sin, God is not happy. So I use this illustration. We are building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We're building on it. But some Christians, when they live in sin, when they build a wall and then they tear it down <clears throat> by the sins, they continue to build and then they continue to tear it down. It then it's serving in vain. So I hope we understand that when we live in sin, we are serving in vain. The worst scenario is that a person can lose his salvation. That is the worst that can happen to him. And even pastors are not exempt from temptation. So this is a reminder and warning from God's law. And then six, how we can avoid following the devil. When we notice that we have a desire to sin, for, instance, for example, when we have lust, or when we have anger, or when we, are, when we hunger for money, or about to tell a lie, we know that it's destructive. So when we notice any desire to sin, we know that it's destructive. And we pray for forgiveness and strength. And then we choose to stop. Okay, so this are, now I have a th five steps to victory. Now here I, I have four steps here. The five steps, first, notice. I notice that I have a sinful desire or any kind of uh, negative thing. Could be emotions, anything. I know it's destructive. Three, what does the Bible tell me to do? Four, I pray for forgiveness and strength. Five, I choose to obey. So I say again, the five steps to victory. 
first I notice it, notice the sin or negative, whatever negative in my life. I know it's destructive. And what does the Bible tell me to do? And pray for forgiveness and strength. And then five, to choose to obey. So here, when we notice we have decided to sin, we know it's destructive. So this is one and two. And then we pray for forgiveness and strength. This is uh, four. So I skip three. Three is what the Bible tells us to do. So assuming that we understand it's important for us to obey God, that God tells us to obey Him in the Bible. And then five, we choose to stop our sins and replace them with the desire to bless people. Okay, challenge. So if you are involved in any kind of sin, anger, lust, lying, stealing, and abusing people or fornication, please ask yourself, do you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you and causing you to feel guilty? Did you respond to the Holy Spirit or neglect Him? So if anyone still live in sin, ask yourself, is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? The fact that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us tells us that God still loves us. God still wants to help us. So that is a reminder from God. God still wants to help us. So God is loving us. So don't give up. Two, we don't just repent of our sins. We must learn to hate our sins. Because sins are destructive. That's why we hate them. We hate cancer because it will destroy our body. And sins will destroy our soul and destroy our eternal life. So we want to hate our sins and turn away from our sins. I'm sorry, turn away from our sins because they can bring eternal damnation. So we must understand this. Uh, wherever it is, a pastor or a lay person, when we live in sin, it can take away our salvation. So we must repent and ask God to forgive and hate the sin and turn away from the sins. And if we know people who are sinning, we should motivate them with God's love and warn them with God's law. So we should motivate them with God's love and, and uh, tell them, God loves you, it's not worth it to lose your salvation. And, and then warn them with God's law. Okay. Now, I'm going to just use this passage to preach on it. To preach on it using this uh, seven points. I just did it, but I, I will demonstrate it so that uh, you will stick in your mind so that you understand how to do your assignments. If you want a certificate, you need to do assignments that, is, that are satisfactory. Follow this instruction. And you need to do 10 satisfactory assignments and then I'll give you the first level certificate. So, interpretation of the biblical passage here. First, the passage says that we were, when we were, uh, that when we were non Christians, we were dead in sin, that we were following the devil, and then we conduct ourselves following the flesh, and then we were children of wrath. And then, but God is rich in mercy and He made us alive with Christ. So that is the interpretation of the passage. And then intro, how people don't live out and do live out this particular nature of God. That there are many Christians and even pastors who steal money without repentance, who have fornication or adultery without repentance. And they give all kinds of excuses. And some of these people, I don't know who, but some of these people, they might not be saved they can lose salvation. It's very, very serious. It's very, very serious. So, so uh, but many Christians didn't understand that. That they still live in sin and they don't repent and they don't understand that it can cause their eternal life. Now, our life on earth is here, it's less than 100 years for most people. There is millions and millions and millions and millions of years without end, forever, forever in hell, or forever blessed by God. It's a big, big difference. And God is alive. God will bless those who love Him. So I hope that we all say that, yes, 
I don't want to live like that. But there are many Christians who live like that. And some people told me that there are Christians, there are pastors who steal money, and some pastors even practice witchcraft in order to have big results when they pray for people. And they are using the power of witchcraft. That is terrible. That is terrible. So if they get more money in that meeting, so what? It's going to cost them their eternal life. So this is introduction. Some people, they don't live out God's nature. They are living in sin. And in God's nature and grace, God is full of mercy. He gave us new life while we were dead in sins. And He is holy. He wants us to live in holiness. He wants us all to enjoy holiness and live out uh, life in love and in holiness. And He changed our life. He gave us the Holy Spirit to guide us to obey Him, to give us a nature to want to obey God. So God has this wonderful nature. His, this wonderful grace, He gives us a new nature. And then whenever we obey Him, He will bless us. He will he'll, uh, reward us. So after we became a Christian, that He made us alive, and then everything we do to glorify God when we obey Him, God will reward us. So this is God's grace. He, give, he changed us, He gave us new life, and He gave us motivation to obey Him, and then He will reward us. And then why people don't live out that particular nature of God? Why Christians still live in sin, or even pastors? Because they think it's okay when they ask God to forgive them later. Now this mentality is, is using God. It's saying, okay, I sin now, and then I'll use God for my forgiveness. And they just want to make use of God. And then what, you know, think about God. What does God think about that? God will be very unhappy, and God sees that. God knows us. So don't think that we can escape God's eyes. He can see that, and so it's in vain to think that, um, you know, I can sin and there is no serious consequence. There is always bad consequences. So the reason why people don't live out this particular, particular nature of God, they still live in sin like when they were not Christians because they think it's okay, or they see other bad examples, or they attempted, the temptation came, they want more money, they need more money. They don't think, they didn't realize that in order to get blessings from God, it's most important to repent and obey God and love God. And then God will bless. God will bless when we love and obey Him and serve Him. And then reminder and warning. So when we sin, we'll give the devil a foothold and he'll come to steal, kill and destroy. Our whole life can be destroyed. So, we can never run away from God. So, all these points, it's up to you to find how many points. Now, it doesn't mean that we want to find 1,000 points. That's too many. We want to you know, limit to a few points so that it impress people. And then how is very important. How is very important. Now, if you say the most, two most important parts are God's nature and grace and how. To let people know how wonderful God is. And then how can we live that out? So how can we live out the life? So we first we pay attention to the Holy Spirit moving in us. When we sin, how the Holy Spirit continues to move in us. We know that God still loves us. God wants to work in our life. So we, want, so we say, God is so wonderful. I want to respond to God. And then... Uh, we appreciate God's work in our life. God is working in my life all the time. He is blessing me. He is changing me. That is wonderful, wonderful. I want to obey Him. I want to serve Him. I want to love Him. Then we have the motivation to love Him. And then the more we praise God, we meditate on God's Word, the more we read God's Word carefully. Now you notice how I interpret the passage. I study it carefully. Study it many times carefully so I understand it totally. So when we understand God's Word and pray more and praise God more, we have a stronger spiritual life. And then we will obey God more. And also we can 
build up a group of Christians who love God together, who pray to God together, who serve God together, then there will be mutual encouragement for us to obey God more. And challenge to people, can we stop letting Satan steal from us? Can we live out good examples? Uh, because God loves us so much and God is very happy. Can we stop the sins and realize that sins are very destructive? Okay, so I hope that you understand how to use these seven points. I'm going to uh, demonstrate this as, uh, um, in a few more themes so that you understand it and so you start to do assignments. You know, it's good for you. It's good for you. When you follow this way of teaching, preaching, your people will see God's grace. They will say, God is so good, I want to obey Him. God will bless my life. They remember every time God has blessed their life. They remember the good things of God. They will like God. They will enjoy God. They will have strength. And then God will bless them because they have faith in God. I want to say to you, you want Africa blessed. You want Kenya blessed. You want to love God and obey Him and serve Him and glorify Him and turn away from all sins. And then God will bless your life. God will bless the churches. God will give you strength. Okay, let me use this uh, outline and use another theme. Okay, another theme is to do evangelism. We want to motivate people to, to uh, tell people about Jesus. Okay, if we use Matthew, Matthew uh, 28, uh, 19 to 20, that the Great Commission, uh, actually 18 to 20, because 18, verse 18, it says that uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And then he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father and Son and Holy Spirit and everything I've taught you, teach them to obey. And also Mark 16, that go and make disciples of all nations. And uh, he is, who is uh, believed and is baptized shall be saved and signs will follow those who believe that they will cast out demons in Jesus' name and lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. So with these two passages, uh, it, we interpret that, that, that Jesus has the authority first before He tells us to, to go make disciples of all nations. And He also gave us authority to perform miracles in Mark 16. So actually in the, all the, uh, for, the Great Commission in the four Gospels, all has the promise of the Holy Spirit and the miracles, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke, it says that you wait, you wait uh, for the, uh, the promise of the Father and you go and you know, preach the Gospel in my name and then you wait in Jerusalem for the power so associate the, associate the sending of the disciples and and the power of the Holy Spirit and in John Jesus appeared to his disciples and said that as the Father sent me I'll send you and then he blow toward them and say receive the Holy Spirit so he sent them and send them give them the Holy Spirit so how people don't live out and do live out this particular nature of God to do evangelism? Why? Uh, how people don't live out? Uh, now, most Christians have done evangelism at least once. I've gone to churches and preached and asked them, how many of you have done evangelism once? Almost everyone raised their hand. And then how many have you done evangelism ten times? less people raise up their hands. And then 20 times, less people. 30 times, less, less people. And then 50 times, not too many people. Because, why? Because they lose the hope in evangelism. They think people won't believe, so they stop evangelism. So that's a fact that many Christians, they've done evangelism, but they stop at certain points. So we want to continue to do evangelism even when people don't believe. Now God gave me one time how to handle that feeling of hurt, the hurt feeling when people reject the gospel. 
you know, Jesus let me have this thought that when we do evangelism, even when people don't believe, one day in front of God, this person, if he doesn't believe in Jesus, we have done evangelism to this person, and Jesus will say to this person, my child has witnessed to you, but you don't believe. And my name has been glorified because the Christians have, have uh, declared the gospel. So our evangelism would glorify God and God will be happy. And it will be also a sign to the non-Christians that the Christians have evangelized them, have shared the gospel with them. It's just that they don't want to believe. So that will glorify God. So it's a fact that some Christians don't do evangelism at all. And then some Christians, they do much, uh, they do, do evangelism often. There are videos online that there are some people go on the street and then they can pray for people for healing and then they bring these people to, to Jesus. And then God's nature and grace. God is full of mercy and compassion. He wants people saved. He has a heart to want people saved. This is His nature. And then He gives us the grace. He gives us salvation. And He gives us the motivation to evangelize. And then, three, He gives us ability to bless people. Remember, the, uh, the first point is God's nature. Second point is God's grace to us. And then the third point is God's grace to us so that we can help other people. So He gives us the Holy Spirit and the wisdom to do evangelism to other people, to help other people, to train other people to do evangelism. And then for when we obey Him, when we do evangelism, God will reward us. So for any point, for the grace of God, nature and grace of God, these are the four points you can think of. Let me use another theme uh, to, to demonstrate this. For instance, um, for healing, okay, we can have healing. First, the nature of God. God is a God of healing. When God comes to people, the blessed people, He can bring total healing. He, he, is, he has perfect health. God is perfect health. He is perfect in every way. He is full of strength. And then His grace to us. He gives us uh, healing. He gives us the gift of healing. And then three, He can give us ability to pray for other people to be healed and give us ability to teach other people how to bring healing to people. So this, His blessing to us and then His blessings to to us so that we can bless other people. And then four, when we pray for people to be healed, He will reward us. Okay, so these four points. I have done a, uh, a slide on this before. I can send you after this class, I will send you that. So, so you see that these four points is easy to think about God's grace, nature and grace. Let me use another example. For instance, um, God has no burden. Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty. Um, he has no burden. He is totally uh, without any kind of burden. And we encourage people to put down your burdens in front of Jesus. So, first, his nature. So God's nature and grace. So I'm. We are still talking about number three. Point number three. The four points we can talk about. That God is a God of no burden, no worry. Second, His grace to us. This is His nature. God has no burden. God is a God of, of being free and no burden. And second, God is grace to us. He gives us peace. He takes away our burdens. Three, He gives us the ability to bless other people. So He can give us the ability to help other people to have no burden by praying for them and by teaching them to obey God, follow God, and then you have no burdens. And then four, when we follow God and have a good relationship with Him and have no burdens, He will reward us. So He will reward us. So I hope 
By now you remember these four points to talk about God's nature and grace. So we go back to here to evangelism, the theme of evangelism here. So God's nature and grace would be first God is compassion, He is full of compassion, He has a heart to save people, and two, He saves us and He give us the uh, the uh, uh, salvation, He give us a motivation to do evangelism. And then three, He give us the ability to do evangelism to people, to the wisdom to do evangelism to, to people, the gift of praying for people so that they can be healed, to bring them to Jesus. And four, when we do evangelism, He'll reward us. Okay, so these are four points in God's nature and grace. That first is His nature, second is His grace to us, third is His grace to us so that we can bless other people, Fourth, when we obey Him, He will reward us. So these are four points of God's nature and grace. Now you can think about more, but these are some four basic points. So why people don't live out, don't do evangelism? Because they, they got lazy, they, they don't like to be rejected, and they think it's useless because they've been rejected. So there are many reasons why people don't do evangelism. And reminder and warning, Paul has said, woe to me if I don't do evangelism. So there's a reminder and warning. When we see people who are not safe and we don't help them, one day God will s say to us, you don't tell your family members about Jesus. You don't tell your neighbors about Jesus. They've been with you for so many years and you haven't told them. So then, then we'll, be, we'll be found unfaithful. So we want to live a faithful life and how how to have the heart for evangelism and how to do evangelism that we first want to have a good relationship with God we have the peace of God and strength of God all the time and blessings of God all the time and then we can tell people God is a God of blessing he can bless me and he can bless you he will bring blessing to you he can give you peace and I can pray for you and then you can have more peace and more joy or healing and then so this is how, this is one way. And then we pray for people to be safe. And we pray for a heart to do evangelism. And we exercise, try to do it. First by maybe telling children about Jesus. It's easier to tell children about Jesus. To help one child to grow in Jesus. To tell them how God loves you. And pray for the child. And then he experiences the Holy Spirit and tell them, see how real God is. So every time you pray, you can experience God and then you can bless other people. So that's practicing. And then also maybe form a team of two or more and go out to do evangelism. Or maybe invite people to your home to treat them with food and then tell them about Jesus. Or help people in different ways and tell them about Jesus. So this is how we can do evangelism. And challenge to people, can we start to do evangelism to people okay so I hope you by now you can understand how to use this seven point outline now the main part actually you know is this uh, three points that are marked in red God's nature and grace and reminder and warning and how and the most two most important parts are God's nature and grace and how Okay, and then uh, when you do an assignment, please write down which part. So the first part and the second part and the third part. Okay, um, I, so we'll stop here. And if you have any question, you can ask me and I'll send you some slides of the examples of how to use this outline to uh, write different sermon outlines, okay? Let us stand up to pray for God's blessing upon you. Please stand up. Oh Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, Father. You are so wonderful. You are God of mercy, God of kindness, God of goodness. You are good and kind. And But we all have a sinful nature. Please help us to repent of our sinful nature and, and understand that sins are destructive. Satan will come to steal, kill, and destroy when we continue in sin. Please forgive our sins and motivate us to 
obey you and follow you and love you and serve you and glorify you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Please come, Holy Spirit. Come and take away our burdens. Take away our worries and our sins. Forgive us. Give us strength. Give us the hatred for sins. Lord Jesus, you are so wonderful. We thank you. We love you. We obey you. We serve you. Your name be glorified. Hallelujah.